While researching this topic, I found myself asking just what constitutes a game. The broad view of any game, whether The Legend of Zelda, Monopoly, or football, is that it's a systematic collection of goals, rules, challenge, and interaction. Thanks, Wikipedia. There's a lot of meaning behind these four simple concepts, but a lot of games utilize randomness in an effort to enhance all of them. As a subset of game mechanics, randomness can affect a gaming experience in all kinds of ways, from extremely negative to extremely positive. It brings to mind qualities like addicting gameplay, replayability, and finely tuned player interaction. And since it finds its way into almost every game we play, it's worth taking a very close look at. Since we're looking specifically at randomness in video games, we'll spend more time looking at the technical side of how RNG, or random number generation, is implemented, calculated, and revised to produce different results. This is a subset of a much bigger question. What is the role of RNG in entertainment? I am wholly unprepared to answer that question, so we'll avoid talking too much about the philosophical value of RNG, and instead focus on its usage in programming. Before we get into it, I need to preface with a very important point about randomness. Think of a random number between 1 and 10. Got it? Now, would you consider this number to be truly random? What if we were to map out your brain activity second by second as you thought of a number, tracing communication between neurons as you think? If we could see the patterns in your brain and understand how they result in your chosen number, then we can easily predict what number you'll choose. The reason we can't do this with some sort of supercomputer is because the human brain isn't yet fully understood, so scientific inquiry will only get us so far. But hypothetically, if this technology were to exist, we would discover that your random number is not random at all. In fact, this idea might apply to every random action in the universe. Currently, scientists believe that subatomic behavior is truly random, but perhaps we just don't understand the underlying processes. In short, it's quite possible that randomness in the universe might not even exist. This is the big point I want to make as we move forward. Quantum behavior aside, everything we perceive as random propagates from a source, following logical patterns of flow. Generally, randomness only exists because of our limited ability to understand the world around us. Drop a coin on the ground, and it'll shoot in a seemingly random direction. But you and I both know that the direction it goes isn't actually random. If we knew everything about the coin's trajectory, velocity, acceleration, mass, blah blah blah, we could accurately model the coin's fate using software that simulates these conditions. The same goes for rolling dice. They're only random to us because we don't know how to roll a 3 or roll a 5. Randomness doesn't really happen because of Newton's laws of motion, which in this case suggests that all actions are the results of forces acting on them. Instead, let's think about randomness as a river that we just happen to step into downstream from the source. To us, the movements of the water are random because we can only see what's happening around our feet. But it's not impossible to go back to the river's source and, with sufficient understanding, fully predict how each and every molecule will behave as they flow. In striving for true randomness, society created coin flips, card draws, and dice rolls, which are definitely not random. We've implemented randomness into video games in a similar way, so keep this example in mind as we move on. With respect to video games, randomness has to be programmed in by humans, so true randomness is both hard to reach and of limited use, as we'll see shortly. Our methods of near randomness are actually a better fit for video games than true randomness could ever be. Most of the time, Game developers and players alike would never want true randomness. This is the argument I'm going to attempt to make in this video. It's more likely that we actually want a modified version of RNG, random number generation, that we can tailor to the game experience. So why do we instead strive for almost randomness? It's easier in a lot of ways, and the vast majority of the time it's more effective for video games. This is pretty clear with a simple example. True randomness can actively detract from an experience because it can skew balance and fairness in a game's mechanics. For example, in Tetris, the order of the blocks, or tetronomos, is not entirely random. Martin Hollis, who designed the N64's GoldenEye and also directed Perfect Dark, explains this perfectly. Tetris doesn't deliver the bricks in a completely random order. It shuffles ahead a set of bricks. If I recall rightly, about four sets of seven. What that does is it evens out the distribution, so it means you won't get a load of S or Z bricks. You can't possibly get more than, say, seven in a row. These kinds of tricks don't make video games worse. They put a lot of work into that, and they believe that it makes the game better. I'm inclined to think that it does. But it does isolate you from the brutality of true randomness. If the game's block order were truly random, then it's entirely feasible that a player could get 60 line blocks, or 1000 L blocks in a row, and then the best Tetris player in the world could be beaten by someone who just had fortunate randomness during his playthrough. This is in stark contrast to a board game like Monopoly, where the dice rolls are random beyond our ability to predict their results. But this isn't the meat of the game, because you can take several different actions on whichever space you land on, and you can make strategic choices in building up properties to buffer the randomness of the dice rolls. 
you have far fewer options than Tetris, so it's better to have slightly more order in block generation. The key point is that randomness was intentionally reduced in Tetris to make the game more fun, and the fact that it's remained a competitive title for decades speaks to the overall fairness of the game. If the blocks were truly random, then the game probably wouldn't be as popular as it is, because the balance between luck and skill would be too heavily skewed towards chance events. Like any game, a combination of both skill and chance can increase playability and competition, but too much of one or the other can be exclusionary to the market. The people that break records on older games like Donkey Kong, Tetris, or Pac-Man get there by becoming more skillful at the game, not because they got a lucky set of blocks to generate. Even though things are left to chance, there are still rules the game must follow, and therefore guidelines that the player can use to hedge his bets and become better. It's hard to overstate how crucial it is to choose a suitable amount of randomness in games with chance events. In a GDC keynote, Sid Meier once said, Any kind of randomness needs to be treated with a lot of care. Whenever something random happens to the player, paranoia sets in. The player feels like the computer rolled that random number just to be difficult. Small doses of randomness, however, can be helpful. Just make sure that it seems fair to the player, so he doesn't feel cheated. Indeed, paranoia is easy to instill in a player, but exceedingly hard to get rid of. If you play a card in Hearthstone that wipes the entire board out except for a single minion, you'll definitely remember the times that your opponent was the lucky one, but you might not always remember about all the times you were lucky. Once you've gotten this mindset, it can take a while before the game can earn your trust back, and you might get fed up and quit long before that happens. This negative play reaction is due to a perceived unfairness in random outcomes. What you really want is for randomness to be fair, and you want to feel confident that there's nothing secretly affecting the odds. Extra Credits has a fantastic video on randomness in esports, and it's worth checking out for more on that topic. So is fair randomness oxymoronic? Not at all. If you're playing poker and the guy across from you whips out a 17 of spades, you know something's up. You know poker hands will be random, but you also know the full range of possibilities you'll encounter, and as long as your skill and luck outweigh another player's, you'll win. The same goes for Hearthstone. The same skilled players find themselves near the top of the ladder after each reset. Randomness can only vary existing rule sets. If the rules are strict, the options for randomness are fewer. If the rules are much more lenient, randomness becomes more dominant and influential. But in either case, what's more important are the rules that developers lay down, that frame what's happening. So we've explored that most video games don't want true randomness, because all video games still have certain rules to follow, and this is offset further by player skill in competitive gaming. So if you don't want true randomness, you're going to have to use a modified form that's specific to your game. Randomness that's tailored to your game is always better, and it's for this reason that developers have come up with many creative ways to make use of pseudo-random numbers. But what makes a number pseudo-random, and why are pseudo-random numbers a choice tactic for game design? A true random number generator is limited by its source. For example, a true random number generator might rely on cosmic noise or some other signal that is so incomprehensible we can't possibly understand its patterns. Even cosmic noise probably isn't inherently random. I mean, if we knew everything about every single object in the universe, we could probably predict with some success how an RNG machine might be affected. But when your source is operating on the quantum or atomic level, you'll get data that is indistinguishable from true randomness. The other point about true RNG is that your system has to collect values from its source at a certain frequency. A true RNG system draws on entropy, like radiation or atomic decay, from its environment to provide values, and it has to do so quickly enough to meet the demands of the destination. If you can sample cosmic radiation 60 times a second, but you actually need 100 values per second, then your system is technologically limited, and you'll have to find a workaround. Maybe you could use a faster system that generates numbers that are almost as random. That workaround is pseudo-random number generation, and while it's not strictly random, it's nearly as effective and a whole lot easier to implement. Let's take a look at a few of the ways that pseudo-RNG is done. We've already mentioned the awesome gaming marathon called Awesome Games Done Quick, which is hosted by a website called Speed Demos Archive. SDA also has an extensive database concerning everything there is to know about speedrunning, and not surprisingly, they've got a fantastic article about RNG in gaming, especially regarding its manipulation by players. So let's explore the technical side of RNG by summarizing some of that article's key points. Note that some of these concepts originate from another speedrunning website, tasvideos.org. Some games will use randomness only when specifically requested, known as per-call RNG. For example, an RPG might rely on this when calculating whether your attack will deal critical damage or miss entirely. Other games might calculate RNG values for every single frame a game is active, regardless of whether a random number is currently needed. This ensures that a value is always available, and is unlikely to be manipulated or exploited. A third type is input-driven, using mouse movement or some other form of player input to determine a number. So let's clarify these terms with concrete examples. 
Percal RNG is commonly used in roguelikes and procedurally generated games for determining level layout. Many games that do this use what's called a seed to generate a level. For example, in Minecraft The Binding of Isaac or Spelunky. Each level is grown from an initial value, the seed, which is a very short sequence of values compared to what it creates. The randomness of the seed is internal to the system and relies on factors not easily manipulable by the player, so the product will be unique. If, however, two players by chance share the exact same seed sequence, then their Minecraft worlds will unfold identically, both in initial layout and terrain generation. Of course, if the internal RNG system is called on again during gameplay, external factors such as remaining health or even the time of day can influence calculations, and two players with the same initial seed may find that they have two wildly different levels in the end. Per call RNG and seed values are most beneficial when games allow you to input a custom seed value. You might want to see the insane level that was randomly generated in a friend's game, or replay a dungeon that you've previously tried. This is almost like an encrypted message, reminiscent of those sent around the world during World War II with the Enigma machine. The Enigma produced what looked like nonsense, but as long as you had the correct key, you could reproduce the intended message. A seed value and the world it creates both work the same way. The Pokémon series uses this seed system to determine certain stats and characteristics that catchable Pokémon will have. If the player can control the seed, then he can also greatly increase the chances of encountering a shiny Pokémon, which normally has a 1 in 8200 chance of happening. If each encounter lasts 10 seconds, you would have to fight almost 23 hours worth of battles on average just to encounter a single shiny Pokémon. Pokémon Emerald always starts with a seed value of 0, and it generates 60 pseudo-random numbers per second so players can time certain actions to de-randomize the game, forcing certain encounters and events. Notice that this seed system is combined with the use of per-frame RNG, which is calculated every frame, even if there's not a need for it. Even still, it's not bulletproof. There are countless guides that detail the exact processes involved in abusing the series' RNG, and this really speaks to the creativity and determination of the fans. If RNG is an impenetrable fortress, then all a player has to do is find a single crack in the wall, and the barrier can be dismantled piece by piece, and then reconstructed to suit a player's desires. But overall, the seed system is perhaps a good middle ground between random and non-random. There's enough variety that each play session will be unique to any given player, but each set of generation rules can be concisely recorded, stored, and shared indefinitely. To the average player, the only time a game using this method is not random is when they're able to accurately predict the outcome of each seed value, and as a result, only players that actively want to skew game balance will be incentivized to do so. For the average player, though, the seed system is just one more thing they can't control, so for all intents and purposes, the seed system is adequate. Next is input-driven RNG. If your favorite first-person shooter has a map that's determined by the movement of your mouse, you might believe that it's random, but if you exactly replicate a previous movement set, you can control what should be a random layout by exploiting input-driven RNG. But as long as the player base never discovers exactly how the map layout is determined by mouse movements, RNG will function as intended. Even if this method becomes public, replicating mouse movement on a screen with millions of pixels is a challenge of its own. In general, RNG methods like this one are typically obscured as much as possible from the player in video games, because a motivated gamer that figures out these methods can have an advantage in competitive play. Sites like PokerStars use mouse movements in conjunction with several other factors to help randomize each game. The same concept is used in security software. A program like TrueCrypt uses mouse movements to encrypt and secure sensitive files, and it explicitly tells you this fact. Instead of sampling cosmic noise, your mouse is sampled as the entropy source that influences the program's RNG. As long as there are no workarounds, there are infinitely many possible keys for an encrypted file, and the sun will burn out long before anyone manages to find out your key. The more I thought about how we don't actually want randomness, the more sense it made to me. It turns out that we frequently don't desire true randomness even in our own lives. At a party, you might want music to play in a random order, as long as the same artist isn't played twice in succession. Or, you might not want any track to play more than once, so you turn repeat off. When you put these constraints on a media player, the outcome is no longer random. By telling it that you have certain conditions that must be met during its random generation, you've significantly narrowed the number of possible outcomes that can occur. If there are only two songs left to play in the playlist, but one of them is by an artist whose song has just played, there's no random factor. The media player will automatically choose the other artist, and you know with 100% certainty which song will play next. Contrast this with the random drops system in hack and slash games like Diablo 3. You know that all weapon drops are random, but you might not want it this way. If the same legendary weapon drops three times in one day, you might become suspicious of the game's RNG. What you'd really want in this situation is akin to the media player example above, a system that excludes existing items once they've already dropped for you, at least within reason. Ideally, you would have simple control over what kind of items dropped, but because it's far beyond the player's reach, 
we tend to notice apparent trends in randomness. This is known as a clustering illusion, the tendency to see patterns where none actually exist. If you get the same legendary three times in a row, you'll swear that something's wrong with the game if it drops a fourth time. Since you're equally likely to get the same item twice in a row as you already get two different ones, a string of three or four items of the same type or item slot sticks out like a sore thumb. In fact, thanks to the clustering illusion, we can still notice this quite easily. If we agree that the purpose of random loot is to keep the player engaged and actively hunting for his next set of gear, then true randomness will always fail the game's intent, leaving the player with a negative view of the game. This is in spite of the fact that there was nothing the developers or the player could have done to control the outcome. The human brain tends to look for patterns, even where none exist, and critical players will always notice streaks of bad luck, while discounting lucky streaks. So a clustering illusion can have dramatically amplified effects on a gamer's brand loyalty, if he or she decides the game's random drops aren't satisfying, or that playing the game is frustrating. Diablo 3 and many other online titles have modified their RNG even further, so that the longer you go without a legendary, the more likely one is to drop very soon. Remember, true RNG here would actually have floods and droughts of drops, and Diablo 3 sets a baseline for when randomness becomes a little too unforgiving. This is why it's crucial for game developers to actively control random events in their games. The Final Fantasy series has employed random encounters in its games for decades. The first game in the series picks a pseudo-random number between 50 and 255, and will count down for every step you take until it reaches zero. A step on the world map subtracts 6, while a step in a dungeon decreases the counter by 5. The variance is huge here. If the counter starts at 50, you can only take 8 steps. If it starts at 255, you could take 42 steps without another fight. Future Final Fantasy titles revise their random battle counters. It was also probably done, in part, to normalize the encounter rate and prevent the extremes from occurring too frequently. Final Fantasy VI generates a random number between 0 and 255 for every step taken. Furthermore, each step taken on a world map adds 192 to a counter. The game does a calculation for each step to see if the number it generated is less than the counter, divided by 256. If it is, a battle occurs. This system has even more extreme highs and lows than the previous example. You can take as many as 92 steps, or as few as just two before a battle occurs. The above examples are really good illustrations of RNG, and are certainly the result of hours and hours of testing until they felt just right. But they're also great for a more subtle reason. Say you want to use a simpler formula to determine your random battles. After each battle, you randomly generate a number between 12 and 32. This is exactly the number of steps you can take until your next battle. While this seems identical to the examples above, it has two major weaknesses. One, your single determining step here has to be invisible to the player, so that it generates its value from something completely beyond the player's control or knowledge. The problem with this is that input from the player is the easiest way to generate a pseudo-random number, so there's a chance that the RNG method will be figured out. If the method isn't obscured well enough, then a clever player can exploit this to have more control over battle frequency, or even the rewards from battle. Later games in the series spread their randomness out over each step using per-frame RNG, and so encounters were no longer reliant on any single frame or action. The even bigger flaw, though, is that this undermines a fact that encounters are supposed to be random. In fact, Final Fantasy II used exactly this system by storing the single encounter's value in the save file and generated a new one at the end of every fight. It picks a single random number and counts down to zero to start a battle. But because this value is stored in the save file, resetting the game or loading a save have no bearing on when you'll have encounters. If you leave town and take four steps outside before you get into a battle, then you will always have that battle after four steps, even if you turn off the game or reload your save. So if we're told that battles should happen by chance, but we see them occurring deterministically, our immersion with that part of the game is essentially ruined. Even though we know it's just an illusion, actually seeing the random battles occur with regularity makes us aware of the man behind the curtain, and we may find it hard to see the illusion of chance the game wants to provide. In Golden Sun for the Game Boy Advance, there's a weapon with a very low drop rate, making it a reward for only the most dedicated players. However, because the game uses a pseudo-random number to determine if this item should drop, and because the pseudo-random number is directly derived from a player's input, there is a method to guarantee that this item drops for you. If you use a specific series of tacks when your four characters have a specific turn order, the pseudo-random number generated by this game will always be the same. This also applies to the random stat boosts each character gets when leveling up. So if you knew how these boosts were determined, then your actions in battle could be changed to get the maximum increase indefinitely. This is why our simplistic encounter example above isn't optimal. The player almost always indirectly controls a randomly generated number, and it's not a stretch that sooner or later the mechanics behind these calculations will be discovered and exploited. The mechanics behind random weapon drops in Golden Sun were reverse engineered with surprising speed, negating any of the work the developers did to balance drop rates for rare items. 
Final Fantasy XII has randomized treasure chests instead of randomized battles. Each chest has a chance to drop a common item or a rare item, and the chests themselves appear randomly. Players can take certain actions in battle to guarantee that a rare item will be found within a chest. Furthermore, you can use a spreadsheet to find exactly where you are in the game's RNG calculation system, letting you reliably obtain an item that would normally have a 1 in 1000 chance to drop. Knowing the game's RNG conditions also lets you control the spawn rate of certain rare monsters or steal rare equipment and items. The entire game can be broken as long as the player knows how its RNG works. Many RPGs are known for their frequent random battles, and more often than not, a high frequency is seen as a detraction from the overall experience. But there is a very good reason for games with random encounters to use these complex algorithms to determine whether a battle should occur. Let's try simplifying the formula in a different way. Every step taken generates a random number between 1 and 100. If the number is less than 6, a battle occurs. Note that this is more random, but the player will definitely notice patterns. You might fight 6 random battles in 10 steps if RNG is just not on your side, or you might walk through an entire dungeon with no battles at all. Such a simple system doesn't respect the developer's dedication, nor the player's expectations. You might think, geez, there are too many encounters here. How am I supposed to survive when this game doesn't even follow its own rules? It should be fair, not a grind. But you could just as easily be underleveled for a boss and have to work your way back through an entire dungeon after trying. A game that relies on discrete leveling to guide the player seems to be working against itself if its battles are too random in frequency. When a boss wipes your party in a single turn, there's a good chance you'll need to grind to bring the random encounter and level systems back into balance. The same encounter might be a breeze if RNG dictated you fight twice as many battles on the way to the boss. And the boss itself is probably scripted to account for randomness, even though its AI is relatively complex. A simple AI would probably check its HP every turn while attacking a random party member. If its HP falls below a certain percent, it'll use a scripted move and then go back to attacking randomly. A more devious version of this boss would always attack the party member with the lowest HP, ensuring that any party member who's down in battle is unlikely to get back up. The point here is that even though a boss's target is random, its moves in battle actually follow a flowchart that incorporates random targeting. But if the boss attacks the same character five times in a row after you've already wasted four phoenix downs on him, the clustering illusion will strike again, and you'll swear that the target isn't random at all. There's a second logical fallacy at play here that greatly influences our decision making in games, the gambler's fallacy. It says that we tend to assume independent events somehow influence each other, and that future events rely, at least partially, on what has already occurred. If you've ever played a slot machine and thought, eh, I've sunk $20 into this machine, I'm due for a big win soon, then you've experienced this fallacy. We can go back to Diablo 3 and how you might get 20 legendaries, but none of them are the single one that you really wanted. You're not more or less likely at the end of the day to get that item as you were when you started, but you might think you're getting close to it. We both desire and expect form in gaming, even in situations we know have no such limitations. Perhaps it's partially for this reason we find ourselves addicted to games with random elements. We're constantly on the search for some shred of proof that the form and order we expected all along is actually there, even if we know that it's not. We've only touched on a few of the psychological concepts that find their way into making games more fun, but there is a wealth of knowledge available on the subject. We could talk at length about how a game like Diablo 3 is little more than a well-designed Skinner box that conditions players to take certain actions. Casinos and video games use a lot of the same techniques to tickle your brain in just the right way to keep you coming back for more. Since the psychological side of video games is a pretty big topic, We'll save it for another time, but it's worth mentioning here because just like RNG, it can mentally affect the player in any number of ways. Finally, we'll close out this analysis with a look at some of Hearthstone's random mechanics. When I think of Matter Bomber, which does 6 damage randomly divided between all characters currently alive, I immediately think of the time that he hit my hero for 5 and one of my minions for 1, when the board had many minions. I'm less likely to remember the time that Matter Bomber gave me the exact damage I needed to hit my opponent's minions and seize board control even though it happens much more frequently. This is a type of availability heuristic, where your first mental connection could be something rare, like the Mad Bomber example. But as a result, if this is always your first memory of that card, you might not want to use it because you remember how bad the outcome was a single time, even if you used the card successfully 20 other times. In fact, it's not even correct to say that hitting my face 5 times has an impossibly low chance to happen, because every outcome is equally likely. I'm just as likely to hit the other hero for 5, as I am to hit my own face 5 times, but each identically likely outcome seems unique. The availability heuristic also shows itself when you play an unstable portal, which can summon any minion in the game into your hand. When I play this card, I think about all the legendaries and strong minions I can get, and I hope that I'm lucky. I don't often consider that getting Ragnaros is just as likely as getting a Wisp, and that getting two Wisps in a row is just as likely as getting two Baron Geddons in a row. And although I do remember the times that unstable portal gave me a dud, 
I also remember the times when a great minion came out of it, which is when the Gambler's Fallacy ensures that I'll continue to play that card in the hopes of getting more legendaries. RNG is really an essential component to Hearthstone. Player matching, turn order, card order, damage dealt, minions summoned, and minions buffed are all at least partially random, and the first three are completely random. Despite this, the amount of RNG rarely impedes on the skills of each player, and just like in poker, a player with more skill tends to be a player with less skill. RNG, though ubiquitous, doesn't undermine player skill if implemented correctly, especially since both players are often subjected to the same random outcomes of events. It's easy for a practiced player to set up the game board so that Crackle will always kill the minion you want, and it's just as easy for that player to ensure that a well-timed flame cannon hits exactly the target he wants. So as we just mentioned, turn order in the game is random, which means that one player will always have one more mana than the other for the first 10 turns. To compensate, the player going second gets access to the coin, a special card that gives a one-time one mana bonus. A rogue that's going second can have a turn one defies combo, which feels so great to have, but only because the coin is a valid combo card. There's been some debate about how having the coin affects the win rate of certain classes, especially since every deck has a unique rate of play throughout a match. Overall though, the coin is a pretty elegant solution to the turn order problem because it buffers randomness in a way that is still advantageous to both players. The amount of RNG in Hearthstone may seem higher than expected, but it's actually a crucial part of the game's longevity. If there were no cards with random elements in them, the game would turn from a simple game of chance and skill into an objectively tiered series of actions. Whoever gets the luckier card draws will win, and the gameplay simplifications would relegate the game to a niche audience of experts and diehard fans. Chance in Hearthstone is determined never to let you settle into a pattern. If you've ever started a match with a specific plan, you're going to need to change it by turn 5, or even sooner. If you wanted to go even further with this idea, you could just give each player full access to their 30 card deck at the beginning of the game, removing the random card order as well. Of course, now it's not much of a card game anymore, and the optimal strategies will dominate the metagame. In fact, some games with no random elements at all can be considered solved games, meaning that there is a singular optimal plan to ensure that you win every single time. But this stifles creativity and thinking about interaction, so each match would have a predictable outcome. One of the game's designers commented that by removing RNG, bad players will never think they can win, and they will stop playing. This simple sentence explains it perfectly. Shutting out less skilled players creates a negative feedback cycle in the player base, and the game is pretty much doomed to obscurity. Chance in Hearthstone allows anyone to win a match with proper planning and careful choices. Hearthstone could easily be the focus of its own long-form analysis, so we'll stop here. Suffice it to say that, like any competitive game with random elements, Hearthstone still manages to emphasize player skill over luck, but its random elements do a lot to increase the excitement and replayability of the game. There's still so much more I'd like to explore about this topic. We've seen that games with chance elements actually use surprisingly sophisticated pseudo-RNG systems, because true RNG is neither feasible nor optimal. RNG can balance competitive games to give everyone the same advantage over time, or keep you on your toes before your next random encounter in a single-player RPG. At its core, randomness improves gameplay by obscuring outcomes. The less you know about the game's mindset and future scenarios, the more you're forced to think critically in making intelligent choices. And because it's a factor that every player has to deal with, it affects all players to the same extent, even though the individual item drops or encounter locations may vary. A game with chance demands that you develop skill with its mechanics, and know when to make a safe move, rather than a risky one. It's the wrench in the gears of your ideal vision of how you play the game. But if you'd rather have a hundred line blocks in a row, maybe RNG just isn't your thing, and that's fine. I originally set out to convince you that near randomness is ideal for video games, rather than true randomness. It ensures variation, unpredictable twists and turns in gameplay, and instills a relentless desire in the player for just one more turn. Chance that's finely tuned to a game is exponentially more beneficial for both the player's enjoyment and his sanity. When it's done well, randomness is a subtle hand that reminds you that some things are just out of your control, but it also entices you to keep playing. If a video game can be represented with a black and white photo, then perhaps randomness is the palette of colors that you'll use to bring it to life. 